Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, first, it's a pleasure to be here. I make one small correction from Robin's introduction. And I do this because I was not born here. I'm coming from a very long way in the hills of rural Jamaica, where I've just come back from. And so uh, Robin introduced me as Mrs. McClymont. Now in Jamaica, when you were born, in the countryside under colonialism and you've been given a good education, you must introduce yourself with your title, which is Dr. Velma McClymont. My ancestors demand it, especially now. Yes, so we begin with that. It happens all the time, but it gives me pleasure to be able to blow my own trumpet as such. <laughs> Now, before I begin um, to talk about Black History Month, I want to say something about culture. Now, I missed um, the, um, the, the panel before, and I heard people talk about um, fostering that sense of diplomacy and working together and children learning and playing. So um, I thought about this quickly. Now, culture is a shared heritage, yes? And it's passed from generation to generation through artifacts, um, storytelling, memory bank as such, and what we call Orichor, that's oral literature, yes? And that comes from um, West Africa, the griots as such. And of course, it's passed through when we're thinking about art, and we heard about education earlier on. And culture is a set of practices that create meaning for society. So today, um, my talk to launch into Black History Month is to give um, a sort of example of cultural diplomacy. So we all know what diplomacy um, is and what it means, yes? And cultural diplomacy, for those who are thinking, what exactly does that concept, what is that concept? It's defined as soft power. It's an exchange of ideas, information, and that could be to do with art or other aspects of culture. So when we're thinking about literature, for instance, how we, history, um, art, how we disseminate and share information in order to get a better understanding of other cultures, yes? And what springs to mind for me today is the Commonwealth and the Commonwealth Institute. Do people remember the Commonwealth Institute? You could go there and you would see all the nations of the Commonwealth, the flags, you would, you'd see the natural resources, the history, the people, people and also costumes. So all of those things are bound up with our culture. Now, during Black History Month, we are not just celebrating culture. We are actually um, marking the achievements of black people against the odds. And by that, I mean people of African descent, because we are now, as of 2015, yes, people are people aware that we are in the international decade of people of African descent. Are people aware of this? So the UN has designated, so for the next 10 years, well, it's not 10 now, is it, from 2015, and it means that um, redressing past wrongs and um, acknowledging and recognizing injustices and inequality here and now. So when we think of black history, it is not about just sharing music. It is not just about sharing food. It is not about costumes alone. It is actually about obstacles overcome. It is about the contributions of black people globally to world history when we're talking about inclusion and exclusion. It's also very important at this moment in time for us to be aware of black history. Not For me, it is not so much a, of a celebration. It, it is that it should be incorporated in world history as such. But 
This month is designated Black History Month, and it's a wonderful time for cultural diplomacy, because when you're thinking of governments as such, you can see how, I want to use exploit, but in a positive way, how governments can when think of tourism, because I've just come back from Jamaica, and how you can showcase the best of a nation, of a country, your culture and the icons, the artifacts. So if you were thinking of Jamaica, obviously I'm going to fly the flag today, and so that's Commonwealth. So we're thinking of all the Commonwealth nations here. But if you were thinking of Jamaica and culture, immediately what springs to mind is that people will be thinking about reggae music and Bob Marley and maybe Usain Bolt, you know, in, in terms of sport. So you can see how how governments can actually get involved and that NGOs, uh, charities, and how individuals can become a part of this cultural diplomacy that we are talking about and how we can also use cultural diplomacy in a sense to influence decision makers. So if you were a community group, during Black History Month, it's a fantastic time if you're able to get funding and if you're able to then influence the decision makers. Are people following me? Yes? So um, think of any organization, for instance, in June, so they're still doing some work now. I um, was privileged, excuse me, my voice has gone strange. I was privileged to chair uh, apprenticeship, it's div equality and diversity um, in BAME apprenticeships. So you can see how community groups during this month, Black History Month, can influence decisions uh, that have been made about young people through cultural diplomacy. And also when we are looking at cultural institutions or authorities. So you're thinking about um, museums, galleries. This is a wonderful time during Black History Month to be thinking about education and working and engaging with such organizations to ensure that the history that I've just spoken about, that people are not left behind, that they're included in the history of the nation as such, yes? So it's a wonderful way of looking at cultural diplomacy, how you work with local governments, yes? Cultural institutions, and how you as an individual can get involved. So today, when we're thinking black history, how am I getting involved in cultural diplomacy? The mere fact that I'm here and I am speaking about um, culture, my own work, for instance, which I'll briefly mention, we don't have a lot of time to dwell. So I'm here as an author, a writer, and I can be a historian in another place. Do you see how I am involved as well? Because by speaking here today, I may well influence somebody in this room to go away and to think of ways of including black history per se when you are looking at the curriculum, yes? Um, and that's a big um, area that it, it's probably not wise to touch on right now, perhaps later on as such, because there's a lot of work being done to bring black history into the forefront, not just in October, but all year round and in terms of higher education. And at the moment, we have a lot of institutions. I'm pleased to say even Oxford University, I've noticed uh, something came around recently. Every institution this month, they all seem to be doing something. And you can see that is cultural diplomacy at work during Black History Month. So in an... Um, to cut this short now, because I'm used to lecturing forever, 
and we need other people to speak, I am going to demonstrate cultural diplomacy at work. And by doing so, I am also giving a critique of culture. So I'm going to read four poems from my, a collection that I have just finished, or I thought I finished, but when I was on the beach in Jamaica two weeks ago, I was still busily changing and editing as such. So one speaks of colonialism. We heard Robin mention because um, my thesis looked at British colonialism. Um, another one, uh, they're all to do with journeying, identity, belonging, and so culture, when you're thinking of the commonwealth, a nation of people, a family, an extended family, we're talking about identity, belonging, cooperation, and unity, yes? And so, without further ado, let me just read what you will find in terms of culture, and we think uh, Jamaica, you may well hear the odd word that you're not familiar with. And that's one way of sharing my culture in terms of multicultural, if you like, with you. So the first, I'm going to try, if, if it's at all, um, Robin or, I'm sorry, who's timing me, um, but I'm going to steal time today because time waits for no man, okay? So the first poem is called Walkfoot Woman, and the collection is Walkfoot Woman and Other Poems. Now, Walkfoot Woman speaks for itself. In the last two years since the Commonwealth Games people, so that's Scotland showcasing culture and its cultural diplomacy at work as well. I have visited, I think, um, Scotland seven times and other, I think I've made 14 trips abroad, research as well as um, this wanderlust from uh, what is happening to me. So the first one says, Walkfoot Woman. Strolling through the glade, I picked up a stick when a faint sound came from a clump of bushes, causing me to turn in the direction from whence it came forth. To the east, I think, whoosh, a smack rather like a sibyl jack, followed by, Yasobandu, you have kwati? Ahude, I called out. No one made answer. The voices survived only as faint echoes from the past. All at once, the shamamaka leaves curled and closed on a breath of wind. Touch me not. The glade suddenly gave way to dense woodland, where I left a trail for those who would come after. I, the walkfoot woman, let tied seven strips of my plaid head tie on random branches. Yes? So a sibyl jack is rather like a cane, and it would have been used on the slavery to beat the enslaved. And kwati is like a coin that I went out of use um, in the 1960s. It would be like threepence, threepenny, something like that. And yasso is over here. Bandu is this headband, and that's what you call somebody wearing a headband, okay? And the shema maka is just chameleon grass. But that is how you are sharing your culture in terms of language as well with others to foster an understanding. Yes? Now, the other one is called masking. So when we think colonialism, during this Black History Month, we are only thinking of British colonialism. So I felt that I've done enough of finger pointing over the last two years in Scotland. So I wanted to look at American, um, and to look at racism in America, but not necessarily in a negative way. I want people to think. So cultural diplomacy is also about when you publish a book and you write it, you want people to read it and to get some kind of understanding, to empathize and sympathize as well, yes? Um, with characters, or even sometimes you're thinking, is this to do with the writer? So it's called Masking. You will hear two names, two books, Going to Meet the Man, James Baldwin, an African-American writer, Home to Harlem, Claude McKay, Jamaican writer, 
in Harlem, and you will hear about um, the Tea Party, and that's a permanent feminist exhibition at Brooklyn Museum. And you will know about some kind of segregation in America, especially in New York on the subway, and I've experienced it on a number of occasions. So it says, masking. Right in the, cr the crowded, excuse me, any water please? My voice is going to do a croaky thing here. But I'll try and... Um, thank you. The wonderful thing about experience is that you, you don't rush and um, as you do when you're a younger reader, writer, etc. Now, ride in the crowded subway in Brooklyn Heights. Conspicuous consumers clutch their pocketbooks with frozen faces like masks and sly civility, harboring an inherent hostility towards otherness. Ousted from digs in going to meet the man, Baldwin's Peter returns to Harlem's embrace. Here, roomy-eyed old Southerners croon Gershwin's summertime and the living is easy. <laughs> Reliving the great migration north, raising a faint smile at a calico queen at the bar the unbelonging sips whiskey at Small's Paradise, fuming about the expulsion from a white house, railing, your door is shut against my tightened face. Home to Harlem, working gals click-clack their way down Lennox Avenue in stiletto heels, hunting libertines to dance the Charleston on floors the size of a postage stamp. Downtown whites embrace the trumpet player doing the black bottom with no care. Lo, the cotton club is closed to the likes of McKay's Jake on the run from duty call the army. On a street corner, a busker strums his banjo vying for premium space with girls on the line. Nearby, blurry-eyed, two-tone brogues roll the dice in the local shebeen. Luck be a lady, luck be a lady tonight. <laughs> Ride the dreary subway to the dinner party uptown. Exhibition at Brooklyn Museum. The guests of honor, Sappho, Bodicea, and 37 sheroes dine on veal. Oh, how comes Sojourner Truth is the only soul sister favored with a nameplace set in? Aha! 990 other sheroes inscribed in gold letters on heritage floor. So if you go to the museum, they have over a thousand women, the names, and 37 place settings of women who've made a contribution to history, but only one black woman is given a place setting. So I was very upset about it, looking for Tony, tell me, to, Tony? Tony Morrison and Alice Walker and Maya Angelou and couldn't find them, but their names with 990 others inscribed in gold under the table. So I left um, America. Um, I, in fact, I started it there. Um, now the other one, every writer these days um, seem to be inspired by ghost stories, which I don't do very well. And I thought, let me do something. It is nothing to do with history. This one is called The Collectors of Souls. Come away, come away, the night spoke in whispers. Will you not come away, the voices coaxed. Come away from that empty, arid place, urged the collectors in their soft voices. Black robes draped over their 
stick, thin shoulders, skin withered away with protruding ribs, and sunken eyes filled with a thousand lives. Come away from that desolate ruin. In spite of the sun and the raging heat, bareheaded blind boys built jet black sandcastles while girls, uncovered from the waist up, sat on the sands of time in the afterworld. Come away from there. Come, give up the fight. Come, sleep away the dark night of the soul. I don't know, it's very strange. It just came in one writing, and I thought, wow, where did it come from? Anyway, the last one, thank you all for bearing with me, is called brata. Brata is a Jamaican word. Again, I am sharing culture with you and language. It is like a baker's dozen. So if you go to the market, the vendor will throw in an extra item, often fruit or whatever, yes? And coming to the podium late is because I've been writing a colossal book for over a decade, and every time I think I'm finished, I've just been to a, um, an indigenous um, people of Jamaica, the first people before Columbus, the settlement, and also saw the original Spanish settlement with the cathedral, and then obviously when the English came from the very shores, I stood on the place, the plantation, and so I am floored because I now have to go back to the book. That's why it can't be finished. Every time I go to Jamaica, different plantation, different history. Um, so, and also, it is about my, um, the writer's journey and some of the things, the obstacles. So it is semi-autobiographical, I shouldn't tell you that. Now it says, you too should have traveled, taken the road less trodden, walked with no means of transport, visited unloved places, heard contemporary echoes of the past, caught your foot in a man trap. Do you suppose I care or that I've forgotten how you took your best shot at me? Can words really cut? like a shard of broken crystal or a piece of cold, sharp steel. If memory serves me right, you try to dim my light, yet still I outshine you. Do you suppose I fear coming to the podium late, feeling the empty space? Who said I couldn't succeed, couldn't shift the insurmountable obstacles in the way of my pursuit. Though our paths cross annually, marking how far we've come, yet still I rise. And that's also a nod to my Angelou. <laughs> Thank you very much. So do we, do we stay? Could you? Could you stay and uh, take questions and answers? Hmm? Have some comments or some some questions? Yes, yes, whatever. Yes, yeah. I see. Actually, it's very nice to hear the the accents and the <coughs> new sounds. It's lovely, lovely to hear. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, it's lovely, lovely hearing you sing. It's lovely hearing you sing. Oh, <laughs> I, my husband says because I'm called Rose, I have a pet name. Jamaicans, for some bizarre reason, give their children pet names. My husband's always saying, Rose, no more singing. <laughs> Good evening, daughter. Good evening. I have one question that, uh, yes. of a curiosity. When I see Jamaican flag, yes. there is a three colors. Yes which you find in many African countries. Exactly. Any meaning for this? Well, you see, the, the yellow is for the sun, green is for the land, and black is for hardship overcome. Um, now, you must understand that this was 1962, and when the decision was made, when Jamaica became independent, so it was no longer the Union Jack, yes? Um, so I don't really know, but when you consider 
that 90 something, if you're thinking of the population of Jamaica, it's about 90 odd percent are African people of African descent. So therefore, the fact that uh, a flag in say, I can't think because my brain has gone to Brazil, you see that flag. The, the fact that a flag from Africa has the colors um, uh, or Jamaica has the colors of a flag from Africa um, should not be surprising because we are part of a big global family. And when you're thinking black is for hardship overcome, yellow is for the sun, green is for the land and the grass, you can see how that can equally move on to somewhere in Africa as well. But I'm sure there is something else, and I love that question because I need to, anything that somebody, you will ask me and I'm not giving you a full answer, I gotta research it. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to find out, uh, in most of your writing, mm -hmm. I don't know whether you've included um, um, the kind of modernity which includes um, uh, the whites, in a way, um, that um, maybe with the neighbors, or maybe the way, uh, n not forgetting the past, forgetting the past and mm. looking at the future more or less, that this is how we're treated, this is our, because I've, I've read your poems and they're good, yes. but there is that element of not including the white so much, so that and that culture um, inclusion. I am jumping would and be equally stopping you yeah. because I'm so <laughs> fired. Now my next book, yeah. because that is my issue, um, is I can't tell you the title, but it is a collection of short stories. And in that particular book, because what happens as a writer, I've written a number of books for children, uh, you know, and they've been well received, but a book has to come out of you if you grew up in the Jamaican countryside under the shadow of colonialism. We have York Castle, Edinburgh Castle, and great houses. Now, as coming to England, you also have have to include the experience here. And if you read Birds in the Wilderness, that includes the experience of migration, survival, dispossession, and also um, the host nation as such. But the next book, yes, not the next next, because um, that's the, that, the third one. So I'm, I said two books, but I equally write short stories, and every now and again, something happens and I have to write, and you will find a lot of white characters. But the book I'm writing about colonialism, it is about six generations of, a, of white women in the Caribbean, and they do eventually come to England, and you will see how that pans out. So um, the white minority are not excluded. In fact, they are at the crux of the book and not necessarily slavery, slavery as such, because as um, families intertwine and you will see how people engage with each other. So it's not all about oppression as well, yes? Anybody else? Sorry? Songs. Can you sing the song? Yes. Um, okay, I will quickly sing one. Um, je, uh, what should I sing? Carry me a kigol in stead market, not a quatty what sell. Carry me a kigol in stead market, not a quatty what sell. Lord, what a night, not a bite. What a Saturday night. Lord, what a night, not a bite. What a Saturday night. There you go.